Well, good morning, Greenwich. Today's Wednesday. It's hump day, uh, July 29th. We are almost at the end of the month. How could it be? Uh, I'm eager uh, to share with you today. Uh, our psalm is one we have uh, read and considered before, the psalm of the seven thunders, the voice of the Lord thunders. Uh, but the passage that we'll be reflecting on in our theology uh, section of our morning uh, is one that is uh, one of my favorites. And so uh, let's dive in uh, to the psalm, uh, Psalm 29, and then uh, we'll, we'll get to some theology. So Psalm 29, this is a psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Amen. And so the, the, the theme, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord that accomplishes so much in creation. The voice of the Lord, of course, spoke creation into being. Therefore, the Lord is over the creation. And he reigns and rules over. And what we often experience is chaos, and we are arguably living through such a time. The voice of the Lord continues to be enthroned over all of that. And so uh, we walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, we don't give in to just appearances. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is what convinces of that. Because on Friday evening, <laughs> as Jesus was crucified, uh, the appearances were not good uh, for the people of faith, <laughs> for the followers, uh, for the world, for those who had hoped in Jesus. But then on Sunday, on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And so, the very shape of the gospel teaches us not to give in to what our eyes perceive. That there are things happening deeper um, than what we can uh, physically perceive. That God is at work. And so in such a time as we are living in, uh, the time of pandemic, been arguing for these four months now or so, and these daily studies that God is at work, God is doing something. And so we lean into his word, we trust in, in his word. In a time of civil and social unrest and cultural change that is upon us, we believe God is at work. And so again, we, we're not fooled by what our eyes see, but we have a confidence that there is a, a, a voice of the Lord and a God who sits enthroned over uh, the, the chaos uh, and the thundering of the ocean and the flood and all that is going on, that, that visible, it's a word picture that is being given to us. And so the voice of the Lord is powerful, the voice of the Lord is majestic, and the voice of the Lord speaks through these scriptures. And so we rightly give our attention to God's word. And so to that end, uh, these last several weeks, uh, doing some theological reflection together. And so uh, our Theology 200 series, as I'm offering it and, and, and framing it out, is on salvation. And what it is and isn't, how the cross of Jesus Christ 
is the central act uh, in the salvation drama as revealed in these scriptures. Again, this is our sacred authoritative text. We don't look to ourselves as the authority, but we look uh, to the text uh, of these, these uh, writings. And so what I'm offering this week is this, how do we live into this salvation? And I'm offering that the cross-shaped life or a cruciform life is the life of faith for the Christian, okay? And so have offered uh, some initial thoughts, some elements of what that is, and then unpacking. And so today, I would, so yesterday was Philippians chapter 2, okay, L looking to Jesus, how he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, emptied himself, took the form of a servant. This call, our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And then we have that, that, that picture there. And so today, I uh, want to continue on with that, but some introductory thoughts the mystery and paradoxes of the cross of Jesus Christ. And some of this is drawn from other places in Scripture and then just a general reflection. And so I've shared last week that there is this transfer of the innocence of the substitute that is, that is shown us or foreshadowed in the Old Testament um, sacrificial system. The, the life is in the blood, therefore atonement is made through the blood. There's an innocent substitute, and so the guilt of the, the individual sinner and the community of sinners is transferred to the innocent substitute, pictured by the priest laying the hands on the scapegoat, and then the innocence of that uh, substitute is transferred back to the community, and there is forgiveness. And so the substitutionary atonement, and so today's passage actually has one of those one of the, some of that language. Um, there is this weakness and power. We can say Jesus died in weakness, but it took great power for him to do that, to restrain himself. The miracle working power that he had, that he exhibited uh, throughout his ministry, could have been manifest, it could have been released, as it were. He had legions of angels at his disposal. So what looks like weakness was actually power. The Apostle Paul writes about that, that in our weakness, the power of God is made known. There's nothing commendable in us. You know, it's not our righteousness. It's our weakness. It's our sin. And so when we're weak, then we're strong. There is this this, this kind of mystery, the power of God is revealed through Jesus' weakness or death on the cross, the power of salvation. And so there's kind of a, a mystery there between weakness and power. Freedom and submission. And so Jesus freely submitted himself to death on the cross. That was the message of yesterday. And in the submission, he finds a freedom. And, and so there's a, a, a mystery there that freedom is not freedom to do whatever we want, but it's freedom to do what we ought. And so freedom is always with constraints or restraints. And so, so had Adam and Eve submitted themselves to God in the garden and have not eaten of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that, that boundary, that, 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 that constraint actually would have given them freedom. They were free to eat of any tree in the garden but this one. And so freedom always has constraints to it. And, and the modern notion of freedom, the, the, the sinful, broken notion of freedom is freedom is from all restraints, all constraints. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, wherever I want, with whomever I want. And that's a lie. That's what the serpent was saying. God knows that when you eat of this, you'll be free. He was asking them to to not submit and try to find... No, so submission and freedom, there's this mystery. And so in Christ's submission to death on the cross, he releases true freedom. And so the, the cross-shaped life holds these in tension. And then, of course, there is that mystery or paradox that through the death of Christ, he tramples down death so that life, eternal life, is manifested. And then anyone who would follow me must pick up his cross and... And in living 
for Jesus Christ, we must die to ourselves. And so this is the notion of the cruciform or cross-shaped life. We actually find our life when we lose our life. And there's tension there. There's, there's, it, it sounds like a paradox or a contradiction. But those who surrender themselves look not only to your own interests, that was the language of Philippians 2, but also to the interests of others. We are now free to serve. And so there's this, the, the, the mystery and paradox of the cross invites you to consider some of these, these uh, polarities or, 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 or paradoxes or tension points and to, and to reflect on them. So the idea is that there is actually a joy and a hope and a confidence and a freedom that comes to us as the followers of Jesus Christ as we embrace a cruciform life. It sounds nutty <laughs> to those who are outside the faith you know, dying to self, not pursuing your own interest. What, are you kidding me? Of course, that's the whole point. You know, growing up and getting away from mom and dad and getting your money and getting off and living, doing whatever you want. That's real life. Nope. <laughs> and, and so, not according to Scripture. We'll say it that way. If we take, take Scripture as our guide and our source of authority. Okay. So, with that kind of as a backdrop, let, let's go ahead and let, I want to read 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, a portion of it, okay? And so, um, if you were um, gathered uh, Sunday night for our Vesper service, I read from just before this, okay? Uh, just before this passage. Okay, so I'm going to pick up... Uh, <clears throat> uh, for, I'll pick up in verse 13. I say verse 14, but verse 13 might make a little sense. If we are out of our mind, it is for you. <laughs> If we are in our right mind, it is for you. <laughs> so, um, I, 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 I misread that, I'm sorry. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Paul's, he, he's, he's, he's wrestling with this. It sounds crazy. Paul's saying, the things I'm saying I know sound kind of crazy. It sounds like we're out of our mind. But if we're out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we're in our right mind, it is for you. And so it's this sense of we're, we're honoring God with this message that we proclaim, which sounds strange to our ears, but in our right mind, we're doing this for you. So, sorry, I, I misread that at first. Verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. Okay, and the all there, I think, is Jew and Gentile. Okay, so the, that's maybe for another day to, to study. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And so there's that theme again, okay? That theme <laughs> that they should no longer live for themselves. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a lot going on there. This is one of my favorite passages in the entire New Testament. It, it, it has so much compressed and condensed into it that as we kind of peel it back a little bit or let it unfold, there's this fruitful um, reality that, that, that is central to the, the, the Christian life. 
little context for the Corinthian church. Um, it was a libertine city. It was a, it was a significant city, a trading city. And, and so everybody had to come to Corinth to do business, okay? Um, and so kind of anything went as well, okay? There was a lot of pagan religion going on. And so when people come to faith in Christ, part of the struggle uh, of the early church in Corinth was this newfound freedom from their sin. They thought, well, I can just go sin more and I'll be forgiven. And so there was this libertine spirit. Factions had developed because there were various teachers that came through. Well, I belong to Paul. I belong to Apollos. I belong to, to Christ. And so they were lining themselves up kind of like almost like denominations, lining themselves up behind their teachers. And then a factional um, kind of tribalism, that thing we've talked about, was, was setting up. And there was some conflict within the church family. Okay, And so there's a little bit of background to it. There's more to it than that, but, but I think that gives a, a nice summary that every uh, New Testament letter has a little bit of context to it, historically and then situationally, what's going on. Okay, and so Paul uh, says, Christ loves compels. We're convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. So he's speaking, again, this death life. But those who live then, okay, he died for all, that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. And so there's this theme again, this Paul who wrote the Philippian letter, it's a theme of his, that Christ's death convinces us not to live for ourselves, okay? That, that that's the problem is we've been living for ourselves, that's the problem of sin. That's what God comes, that's the enemy, the true enemy that he comes to rescue us from. The chains are not, not outward chains, but inward chains of always living for ourselves and all the destruction that comes from that. So Christ's love, Christ's death, teaches us, convinces us that true life is found not for living for ourselves, but for him who died for us, so living for Christ, okay? And so there's that theme, okay, in the cruciform life, okay, we, we die to ourselves that we might live for Christ. And then this interesting statement, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. It's an interesting Greek phrase that sits behind where it says worldly. It, it's two Greek words, katasarka, according to the flesh. We no longer see or view anyone according to the flesh. And so the translators of this particular version took that according to the flesh and wanted to, to translate as worldly. According to the flesh is according to the sinful nature. Okay? So if we go back to our theology 103, I think it is, where we talk about the human family and, and all of a sudden what sin does to us and the tribalism, when we... When we sin, we become a law unto ourselves, and so we look at others often as rivals, as enemies, because I'm enthroned as a king in my own little kingdom, so I see others who hold a different view than I do, or say things to me that I don't agree with, and I see that person as a rival, I see that person as an enemy, and then we gather up with others who see the world we do on a, on a particular topic or issue and we become a moral tribe and then we demonize and we feel justified in attacking that other group, in group, out group. And so we've talked about that a lot, particularly in our study on race uh, a number of uh, weeks ago. And so this is what Paul's saying. We no longer view the world that way. We don't view it according to the flesh, according to the sinful nature Though we once regarded Christ this way, and Paul's writing as one who used to persecute the church. We have to remember Paul's own uh, biography. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He, he w he'd gone to Harvard. He, he, he had gone to the top school and studied theology at the feet of Gamaliel. And so he knew that Jesus was a blasphemer and these Christians were blasphemers and they needed to be put to death. And so he viewed them katasarka, from a worldly point of view, not from a heavenly point of view, but from a worldly human uh, point of view. And so when you view others that way, you view them as enemies that must be defeated. 
Jesus was an enemy who must be defeated. He must be put to death, and the followers of Jesus must be put to death. And so, if you read the book of Acts, that's what Saul, as he is known at that point, before he has his Damascus Road encounter with Jesus. And so, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We are not going to look catasarca. We are not going to look at people from that through the lenses of sin and, and what sin does to us and that, that, um, that uh, I am enthroned as my own God and my own law. So though we once regarded Christ this way, we do so no longer. And so part of the cruciform life is we change the way we look at people. We don't look through the lenses of our own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding, the proverb says, Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And that's that, that's that tension. Are we going to come at things as God's word says, or are we going to come at things from what our... Uh, kind of sinful framework of thinking says. And then, uh, verse 17, uh, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you're joined to Jesus Christ, if, you're, if you believe in Him and have received His forgiveness, if you're justified, so if you are in Christ, if you're joined to Jesus by faith, you're a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And so here's that that theme, Old Covenant, New Covenant, God's starting all over. First Adam, second Adam. We're going to explore that in a couple weeks in our Theology 300 series as we go through and think through God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we're going to think about Jesus as the second Adam. And so there is a new creation. The New Covenant was framed out of the old creation and now through Jesus Christ, all things are made new. God is starting the world all over again. But it's this foreshadowing and fulfillment, okay? God spoke the world into being. God said, let there be light. And then Jesus, in the beginning, was the Word. And so Jesus is the Word of God that then brings new life, new creation. So it's a wonderful theme that we'll explore uh, 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 in the future, some future studies. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And there's that old, new, old covenant, new covenant theme. Okay, so a new world has begun. And then, little reflection on how we now live. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And so, that what happened on the cross, that's what we talked about last week, God reconciling the world to himself. We're unable to save ourselves, so God rescues us. He redeems us. He, he, he sends the remedy for what has infected us, okay? And so this reconciling, and, and I talked about uh, the breaking down the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile, and making the two into one, that Ephesians passage. I think we might actually look at that over the next couple of days as, as one, of these, uh, one of these studies this week. And so um, he has committed to us that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sin against them. See, that's the forgiveness. That's the cross, okay? And so the, 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 the guilt of the world falls upon the innocent substitute. So God is not counting our sins against us. We now receive uh, his righteousness. We are therefore uh, Christ's ambassadors. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. This is the gospel message. We are witnesses of this, okay? Uh, God is making his appeal through us, and so we implore you. So Paul actually goes to business, and he says, okay, not only have he's entrusted this message to us, I'm going to give the message right now. In case anybody's reading this letter that is not reconciled yet, <laughs> be reconciled to God. <laughs> Put your faith in Jesus. And then he, he gives the gospel in short order. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then in one sentence, he describes, he, he summarizes the whole Old Testament sacrificial system. Here's how God does it. He takes the innocence of a substitute. He who had no sin 
became sin, so the guilt is transferred to him, so that in him, through our faith in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's the great exchange. And so Paul summarizes that Old Testament sacrificial system, the atonement process. He says, this is what happened in Jesus. So be reconciled. And so the evangelist in Paul just comes out, boom, just in case anybody's reading this letter or listening that has never put their faith in Jesus, do it now. <laughs> and so I love this. So I love this passage. You can probably tell. I'm getting a little fired up. And so, so the cruciform life. So we see now the cross at the center of uh, what Paul's uh, writing here. Because of Christ's death, we no longer live for ourselves. Okay, so that's what he teaches us. His sacrificial death. Your attitude should be the same of that of Christ Jesus. You should live the way Jesus lived. He gave his life for us. Jesus did not live for himself. He lived for others. And so now we live towards him. And we regard no one from a worldly point of view. This is huge. We're going to come back to this one. This, I think, is what, what the problem is. <laughs> Even Christians still want to view people from a worldly standpoint, a katasarka. This is what's going on in the world right now. We look at people as enemies, as potential rivals, as in-group and out-group. And so the whole issue of racism, we look at, we still look at people with different skin color and we, we, we privilege our own skin color and we demonize those of other skin colors. That would be katasarka. That would be a worldly point of view. Political stuff, that's, a, that's looking at people politically. Oh, you vote for the red team or the blue team. I'm a red team or you're a blue team or I'm a blue team or you're a red team or you're a bad person. That is looking at others, katasarka, from the flesh, from this, this sinful uh, point of view. But through Christ, we don't look at people that way. And so the cross changes how we see other people. Paul once looked at Jesus that way. He looked at Jesus, Katasarka, from a worldly point of view and just saw him as an interloper, a religious blasphemer. Get him out of here. And so Paul was no doubt rejoicing that, that Jesus would, would, be, would have been killed. That, that would have been delighted of Paul. And so he goes on to kill Christians. He thinks that's the thing to do. Whoops, not anymore. <laughs> I don't view the world that way. I now see the world the way God sees them. So the cross changes how we see other people. They're no longer rivals or enemies of ours. Politically, culturally, socially, religiously, uh, racially, we don't see people as rivals and enemies that we need to defeat. We see them as neighbors in need of reconciliation with God and with us. It, 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 and so it, the cross changes the entire way we view all other people. You say, yeah, but what about those people that mean us harm? They are captured by the enemy. <laughs> they are not the enemy. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in heavenly places. That's Paul in the book of Ephesians. The people who come against us. There, there are people, I, I realize there are people who don't like Christians, who don't like Christianity. They're not our enemy. They're captured by the enemy. We need to view them as neighbors in need of reconciliation. Paul was once that person. But what he needed was reconciliation. And so that, I, I do expect some wrestling with this one, okay? Okay. And so I, I will invite your feedback, your, your, your emails, um, etc. And so please uh, push back on this, but I'm going to double down on this one, okay? Because that's what this passage is about, particularly verse 16. So that this new creation, if you're in Christ, it's the new creation. You're no longer viewing people that way. You're starting over. You're Adam and Eve before the fall, you're trying, to, you're trying to renew your mind so that I don't look at people that old way where Adam and Eve saw each other as rivals. 
Because as soon as the sin happens, they look, they're estranged from each other, they sow the fig leaves, they hide in the bushes, they're, they're afraid of God, they're ashamed of each other. Adam starts to point the finger, you know, it's the woman you gave me, you know. And that's what infects the human family. And the cross removes that so that now, oh, in Christ, as a member of the new creation, as one who's been born again, who's been liberated, who's been led out of slavery, I realize now that everybody needs to get right with God. That's what's going on here. That person needs to come to enjoy what I have come to enjoy. Uh, this, that, that, that Their guilt and innocence and their freedom and submission, all of these realities. So I'll pick up on this theme again, but, but this, is, this is huge. That, we, that Christians ought no longer view other people, other Christians... Others, those who are outside the church, no longer as rivals uh, and enemies, but see them as neighbors to love, to serve, and then to bring the message of reconciliation to. Be reconciled to God. And so uh, I think I'm going to stop there. I've probably gone on a little too long, but hopefully I've given you something to think about and wrestle with today. And we'll pick up again tomorrow, okay? Let's pray. Gracious God, how we thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ and what happened at the cross, you taking our sin, he who had no sin and knew no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of, of God. Lord, cause that message to deepen in us. Cause your spirit to be released in us in, in a new and fresh way. Help us even through this study today to understand that we are to no longer see others as rivals and as enemies. To no longer view people from a worldly standpoint, uh, according to the flesh, through those sinful lenses. <laughs> but to see them as you see them, <laughs> as those that you are seeking to win. And so Lord, help us even this day to take up that message of reconciliation. Help us to live into the, the goodness and glory and grace and freedom and joy of the new creation through Jesus Christ. We do pray for Greenwich, for our sister churches, that this message of reconciliation, this hope of the gospel, the healing and the freedom and the comfort and the joy and the hope, that that would be released. And so comfort those who mourn this day. Heal those in need of, of physical strength and healing. And transform us, O oh Lord, and make us more and more into the witnesses and the ambassadors that you would have us to be and to live more fully into this gospel life. Thank you for this time. Lord, we commit and commend our loved ones, ourselves, uh, our first responders and caregivers uh, into your uh, keeping this day as we continue to walk through this very strange and difficult season of life. Lord, help us to know that we are carved into the palm of your hand. And so we ask your blessing upon us now and forever in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the God who through Jesus Christ brings you into the new creation, may that God bless you and keep you this day and forevermore.